here's the basic lineup. There's three things to match up. Number one, what the system is doing, or will do when it's built. That's the system you're going to model. Number two, what the model is doing. And number three, what the modeler thinks the model does. Now these two, two and three, may be very different. As anyone who has done even a little bit of computer programming knows, making the match is called verification, akin to debugging in computer science. Verification is done by the modeler or modelers working in their own boudoir. Boudoir in the French sense, that's a room you go and sit in and do some serious introspection. Then, number one and two must match. Achieving that is called validation, and of necessity involves close communication with the user. Now, the first two bullet points are another helpful way of comparing and contrasting verification and validation. Did we build the model right? Validation, did we build the right model? The right model is the one that matches the real system. Credibility, the third bullet point, is the reward for achieving both. Credibility exists in the mind of the user or client. Unless and until it's achieved, the investments of the modeler's time, the client's time, and the client's money has achieved no return. If and when it is achieved, the door opens for this return, routinely 10 to 1 or better in simulation studies, occasionally 100 to 1. Now, since verification comes first, we will describe techniques for verification first. And here's one of them. Use modular programming concepts. Build the model in small increments. For example, one segment of a production line or emergency department at a time. Verifying each before moving on to the next. Another good technique. Let only one entity into the model. Does one entity representing a patient, airline passenger, part to manufacture, bank customer, municipal bus? Now that list, its variety, tells you how powerful simulation and versatile simulation is. Does that one entity go where it should? at the proper times. If the model malfunctions for one entity, it's not going to work right for a multitude of entities. Then, more subtly, temporarily, replace all expressions of probability with constants. For example, instead of saying, entities arrive with inter-arrival times exponentially distributed with mean four minutes, have an entity arrive exactly every four minutes. Or as sketched here, more readily visualizable perhaps, instead of saying the service time is triangular with these three parameters from three up to four and a half, average three and three quarter minutes, make all the service times 3.75 minutes. And double check the array subscripts. Many simulation packages allow use of arrays, as programming languages do. Arrays are very powerful concepts, but they're also fruitful sources of error. Most commonly, the error is falling off the end of the array. Now, as the saying goes, if it can't happen, error trap it. Or as the passengers would like to think, no, the ship can't sink. It's unsinkable. But we do have lifeboats and life jackets aboard. Or driving a car. 
a sensible, prudent car driver wears the seatbelt. In this conceptual pseudocode, this is the wrong way to put it in the model. This just assumes it must be two if it's not one. This checks, is there some error we never expected? And if there is, the model will say so in its output and will know where to go to fix it. Another good verification check is directional analysis. The examples on this slide all help expose errors in models. Now there's an analogy from calculations in chemistry. If the temperature is increased, the reaction should run faster. If the volume of the gas is decreased, its pressure should increase. Likewise, if these things don't happen in a model, and here's an interesting example from auditing, there's certainly likely to be an error someplace. Now, remember, a Mars probe was lost because English and metric units were intermixed. That was a few dollars. If entities arrive faster, then the first queue can accommodate them, leading to this second bullet point. What happens to them? In most simulation software, their arrival is canceled. They just never appear. And the software may or may not provide warning. What would happen in the real system? Well, for one example, the prospective customer might decide, oh, heck with it, I'll try another restaurant. That would be modeling a restaurant. In a factory context, the incoming part might decide, well, I'll just have to arrive and I'll sit in a big messy pile on the warehouse floor. So those would be very different behaviors. Now, here's two further techniques. Check that entities reach all parts of the model. If not, why not? Is there one machine in the model that's never used? Is that an error? Is that segment of the model needed at all? If not, why is it there? Now, with 35 years modeling, I'm old and gray. You can't see that over the computer, but I've would ask myself with respect to a logbook of errors, have I seen an error like this suspicious model behavior before? Oh, that does look suspicious, whatever it might be. Well, now let's move on to validation techniques. Validation entails much more client involvement. Now, confer early and often with the emphasis subject matter experts, like the clients. The modeler or modelers, might be a team, must not go behind the closed door, work on the computer for a time, and then return to the client with, here it is at last, presenting a supposed finished project. Well, maybe it's finished all wrong. Communication should have been taking place with the client all along, not at the very end of the model building. Now, here's some common data issues in validation. The data is not representative of what the model even needs. Maybe the model wants delivery data and we have sales data. And here's some other examples. One factory worker recorded machine was down from 11.40 p.m. to midnight. Then her shift ended. The next worker recorded, machine down from midnight to 12 a.m. No, the machine did not have two downtimes of 20 and 15 minutes each. It had one downtime of 35 minutes. Or another example, the downtime was quite short, clear a jam in the machine. The machine operator rationalizes Oh, I won't record it. Recording it would take me longer than it did to clear the jam in the first place. A third example, and much more dangerous, 
the amount of downtime that really occurs reflects poor adherence to machine maintenance policies. Well, I'm the department four person, and that doesn't make me look good, so I'll forget a lot of the downtime. Now, the three examples I added to this slide all involve downtime. Now, is that a coincidence? No. Downtime data and concurrently data for length of repair is consistently one of the biggest problem areas in getting accurate data. So I emphasize that. Now, what's a structured walkthrough? Well, it takes advantage of the fact that fresh eyes often see errors psychologically invisible to the person who first made the mistake. Like, why won't my checkbook balance? You show it to someone else, your brother, sister, spouse, oh, they find the error right away. Now, in a structured walkthrough, the team members shall we say vote or give their opinion on model validity. And the winning vote on model validity is not the majority vote of the reviewers. If three of them say it's wonderful and one says I see big problems, the most pessimistic vote is the winning vote in a properly conducted structured walkthrough. It isn't even the plurality vote the most pessimistic vote. It was just one engineer who said, we should scrub the launch. It's really cold this morning, and I'm not sure about the O-rings. Unfortunately, he was outvoted, very tragically. And what is a Turing test? Well, you get some results from the model, and you get a printed report from the real system. And you take the labels off which one you ask the client is the model and which one is the system. Now, suppose the client tells you, oh, one of these must be the model. The real system always has a much bigger backup there. Your Turing test just failed. And you find out why your model has a shorter queue than the one in the real system. If the client cannot tell them apart, not only is the Turing test passed, but the model has likely gained a lot more credibility, confidence on the part of the client. This test is named after a brilliant British mathematician, Alan Turing. He helped win the Battle of Britain in World War II. And validity of statistical analysis. There's several important issues here. Now, all of these cases are covered in more detail in our input analysis and output analysis webinars. So there's a pitch inviting you all to come back again. These are interesting issues that get deep into statistical analysis. The modeler should be expert at that. And for a case of the last one, here's a situation. And the issue of vital importance is not the technical detail shown here. The vital issue discrepancy may exist within different parts of the model and analysis of it using another statistical package. It is solely the responsibility of the technical analyst to find and resolve these discrepancies. And the first step in doing that is awareness that this problem even can exist. So as the saying goes, it's 11 p.m., do you know where your children are? Paraphrasing, it's 10 p.m., do you know which form your software uses? Vitally important. Now, assumptions were made to build the model. Did the client agree with them? Did the client sign off on them? Does the animation make sense? 
is the model no more complex than necessary? How about traditional queuing theory? All of these questions and issues need careful attention before credibility is earned. Credibility is earned, it isn't just given. So the modelers should think of validity as something you build in. You don't just add it on at the end. 